Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm truly honored to be invited to be part of this panel, uh, especially sharing it with the first recipient of the Deutsche Bank Prize. And, uh, and Stephen has been my hero in my, throughout my academic career. I, I remember when I joined the University of British Columbia as a young assistant professor coming from a small Austrian University of Graz. Uh, Michael Brennan was there and he said, look, we have this reading group and we're trying to understand a working paper uh, and you have to join us. And this was Cox Ingersoll Ross and we spent several weeks going through all the details of this, of this paper. So, um, so my, um, my uh, uh, topic sort of that, uh, that, was, was, uh, that I was asked to, to comment on was monetary policy and asset prices. So, so clearly it, it is related uh, to, to Gene's uh, talk just before. Um, and I, 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 I'm going to, to structure the talk in, in the following sense. I want to talk a little bit about uh, after introducing it, uh, about the effect of monetary policy through financial institutions. Uh, then I want to talk about the link between monetary policy and asset management. And, and then I have uh, one, one uh, or two slides on uh, effects on, on ultimate investors, and then I will conclude. So I, I think I can uh, probably skip the first uh, slide. This is just to motivate we've all uh, followed uh, the, the developments in monetary uh, uh, policy over the last years. On the left panel, you, you see the size of the balance sheets of the central banks of a number of, of countries. You see uh, Japan. This is as a percentage of GDP, by the way. Uh, you see uh, Europe um, is, is the green dot, uh, dashed line, which is not quite as extreme as, as, as some of the others, but of course, uh, Europe is still uh, going into the, the uh, phase of, the, of quantitative easing. And then you have the policy rate uh, on, on the right-hand uh, right panel. And the question is, um, does that affect markets? Uh, uh, does it have any effect? So let me, let me uh, start um, this, this uh, survey or this, this introduction with, with a few puzzles. Uh, here, here is an interesting uh, paper that was just, just came out in, in the Journal of Finance, and, and it looks at the three day in this, this graph here is from this paper, uh, this is by, by Luca and Mönch, uh, that look at stock responses uh, during or in, in, uh, around the window when the FOM, uh, FOMC meetings take place. You know, yeah, as, as we all know, the FOMC is, is the committee uh, of the Fed, which, which basically decides on, on, on monetary policy. And you see the, uh, the, uh, the, the three-day excess returns here. Uh, the, this is the day on the announcement. The dashed line here is, the, is roughly 2.15 in the afternoon when, when the committee announces to the market what the decisions were. Um, and the striking thing here is that you get a, a big run up uh, in stock prices just before the FOMC meetings. Uh, this is like 50 basis points. And, uh, and essentially the, the authors claim that almost all the uh, S&P 500 stock returns since 1994 were earned uh, around in, the, in this three-day window uh, of FOMC uh, announcements. And, and, and down here, uh, the, the gray uh, area around is, is the 95% uh, confidence uh, 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 channel. And, and down here, we have three-day uh, cumulative excess returns on any other three days, which do not involve FOMC announcements. And you see, on, on any other days, essentially, uh, the, the, the returns were close to zero. And it gets even stranger than this, because there's an, an, another contemporaneous paper by Chislak, Morse, and Wissing Jorgensen, um, which, which, which looks at stock returns across the FOMC cycle. And, and basically, they find that uh, these, these are sort of, uh, the FOMC meets eight times a year, 
and so there is a there is a, 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 a number of weeks in between FOMC meetings, and and they find that the returns, the stock returns, are only positive in in the even weeks uh, of the of the of the FOMC cycle, and nothing in the odd weeks. So essentially, uh, these are the days since the last FOMC announcement, you see in the first week it's, it's zero negative, in the, in the second week positive, third week negative, fourth week positive, and, and, and so on. And so this is, is sort of indicative that while monetary policy clearly seems to at least correlate with financial asset prices, but it, it really poses a, a, a difficult uh, challenge for us to explain why that should be the case, especially this, this finding here, uh, because, because uh, there's very little information coming out. This is actually during the blackout period when the, F, uh, the, the, when, when the Fed is not supposed to communicate with the market at all, and, and you, you actually don't find much volatility in the equity market. You actually find the volatility right after the announcement, but the run-up happens before, and so the authors uh, just pose it as a puzzle and, and, and offer very little in terms of explanation. And, uh, and, and the same uh, uh, similar things uh, are, or similar puzzles are, are, are related to, to this finding. Um, I mean, it is true apparently that the FOMC committee communicates with each other in these even weeks, so there might be more decisions being made in, in, in the Fed committee, but, but it's not clear how it, how it translates into prices, how it is communi uh, communicated uh, to prices at all. So um, this was kind of a, a teaser to, to start um, my, my review of, you know, the question is, it is related, is it, it could be just correlation, uh, uh, no, nothing we know is, is whether it's causation or not, uh, what could be the potential channels through which monetary policy influences asset prices? Uh, and, and so I want to uh, give you a little bit of, a, of an overview of the, what the recent macro finance uh, literature says to this. Now, an, an obvious uh, channel through which uh, uh, this, this could be translated or transmitted, monetary policy could be transmitted to asset markets is through banks through financial in institutions. And this is, this is something which has been pushed uh, by Adrian and Shin in, in a, in a well-cited paper in 2008 or by Raghu Rajan uh, in, 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 his in his keynote speech for the Financial Management Association in 2006 uh, and, and his in his book Fault Lines in 2010. And basically these authors say if you have an accommodative monetary policy, you can see that balance sheets of financial institutions seem to grow very fast. And how do they grow? Well, they grow by taking on additional leverage, they, take, uh, they go into the repo market, and they buy assets. They, they, they obviously have to do something on the asset side. And so uh, the, the simple picture that is taken actually from this paper by Adrian and Shin is that this can create price pressure or this, this sort of raises prices on assets and uh, that strengthens the financial institution's balance sheet further, which gives room uh, for more potential, for more debt capacity, and, and so you get this loop. Of course, you get the opposite uh, loop if, if uh, um, uh, monetary policy is contractionary and, and, and firms reduce their, uh, financial institutions reduce their financial, uh, their, their balance sheets. Um, one, one way that uh, banks might channel these additional uh, funds that they raise through, through leverage uh, could be the credit channel. And uh, now uh, Eugene, uh, Gene showed us some evidence which, which actually shows that there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, uh, relation between, between that and, and, and future credit expansion. Um, but there is some evidence, there's an, a number of, of macrofinance papers which, which say, yes, following uh, an, an accommodative monetary policy, financial institutions seem to relax their credit standards. Uh, there's a paper uh, that I've, I've cited here. I, I find kind of one paper quite intriguing, which is by 
uh, my friend uh, uh, Steve Ongina and co-authors, and they look at the case of Bolivia, uh, which, which is a dollarized country, and so the, the monetary policy is exogenous because it's set in the U.S., and they find that if the U.S. lowered its, uh, its interest rate, the Fed lowered the U.S. interest rate, that seems to affect the lending standards that Bolivian banks uh, apply, and they, 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 they seem to uh, relax their credit standards by giving out riskier loans uh, that actually perform worse uh, ex post. So that's, uh, that's, that's one um, uh, possible channel. Another channel that is, that is discussed in the literature is that monetary policy might have an effect on banks, on, on, on cap capital constraints. And suppose, suppose we have a, a, a very simple way to think about that. Supp suppose we have a set of sophisticated investors, where banks belong to that set of sophisticated investors, which, which know how to price and how to evaluate a, 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 a complex financial instrument, like, like an MBS, a mortgage-backed security. And uh, especially after a shock to the, to the balance sheet of those banks, they might not be able to fully arbitrate uh, arbitrage out that market. So there might be, an, uh, the, the, the yields in the, in the MBS market might be too high because you simply don't have enough sophisticated investors who have enough capital to price these securities correctly. And, and so in, in, in such a case, and this is, this is actually a story that I have taken by, uh, from, from a, a paper, Christian Murti and Wissing Jorgensen, and they say, well, if the Fed starts buying up some of those mortgage-backed securities, that frees up uh, capital for, for financial institutions, and therefore uh, uh, that raises the, uh, the, uh, the, the price in, the, in these MBS markets. Now, this, this channel seems to be very narrow. So if, if quantitative easing is going into those uh, MBS markets, then Krishnamurti and, and Wissing Jorgensen show that, yes, they do affect prices in this, in this market, but not very much in other markets, like the broad market for, uh, for, for government, for, for U.S. treasuries. But of course, if you think that fixing the U.S. housing market is, 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 the, is the point, maybe uh, pushing MBS markets uh, has a sort of a, 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 a beneficial effect on the housing market and could therefore have broader consequences. Um, the question is how do how do stock markets or, or stock prices or securities prices of financial institutions respond to quantitative easing or to monetary policy announcements? There's a, a, a recent paper by Shodorov Reich who looks at a, 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 essentially an ev a event study. Uh, how do bank holding companies stock prices and bond prices and CDS contracts respond, and how do life insurance companies' stock prices and bond prices and CDS prices respond to surprise QE announcements? And he seems to find that uh, almost all of those prices seem to respond positively, especially to the first surprise QE announcements. And here are some of the numbers. In insurers' stock price went up by 7.6%, which was much more than the average market. CDS spread fell by 32 basis points, and the bond yields of these financial institutions uh, also uh, dropped. And so this, this could be sort of another channel uh, by um, uh, introducing this QE uh, program, you're, you're raising the value of legacy assets uh, of, these of, of, of these financial institutions, and thereby uh, you, know, you have uh, uh, this positive eff effect, which is, which is kind of uh, analyzed in this paper, a uh, theory paper by Markus Brunemann and Sanikov. Now let me come uh, to, to the second channel. Maybe qu quantitative easing works through, asset, uh, through, through an asset management uh, channel. We all know that delegated portfolio management is plagued by frictions, by asymmetric information, career concerns of managers, regulation, etc. Uh, you seem to have certain limited liability effects in asset management. 
uh, when, you, when, you, when, when, when you have high performance, you get massive bond, uh, fund inflows, and, and that creates almost like a limited liability uh, kind of structure. And, and, the, and the notion here is that the f these frictions might actually be affected by monetary policy. And, and as a consequence, asset managers might change their behavior in, in a certain way. And, and in, in many papers, this is called reaching for yield, that in low interest environments, asset managers are trying to increase their, uh, the yields of their portfolios. And I, I will talk about that in, in a minute. For example, a life insurance company or a pension fund, they might have fixed liabilities, which are not easy to cover uh, under the low interest rates, and therefore they have to reach for yield. Um, and is there evidence for that? Well, there are some papers that, that claim uh, that this is, this is going on. There's, there's uh, this paper that I've already uh, mentioned by Shodorov and Reich, who looks at money US money market funds. And he finds that there was m at least mild evidence for reaching for yield, which means once um, uh, a commutative monetary policy is announced, they increased, these money, money funds increased the yield spread over treasuries, especially those funds which have more administrative costs. Uh, they, they engaged more in that. And there's another uh, recent paper by Di Maggio and Kasperczyk, who look at forward guidance announcements. They, 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 they say, they, they look at events where the Fed uh, announced that they will uh, remain interest rates low for extended periods of times, and they, uh, see, they analyzed how do, the, how do money market funds change their strategy in response to these announcements in terms of the, the spread of their portfolios over treasuries in terms of uh, holding risk, in terms of extending maturities, uh, taking duration risk, concentration risk. And they find evidence for that. They find that four out of three risk measures go up in response to their uh, events that they, that they analyze. And interestingly, they, they distinguish um, between money market funds, which are uh, run by independent companies and such uh, that, that are owned by large financial institutions. And those are owned by large financial institutions. They might have more reputation problems of doing that. So they, they, they choose to exit the market rather than reaching for yield. But the ones that are independently owned seem to be engaging more in that. This is also going on in the bond market. Here, here's a paper. Uh, that, uh, that is by Boo Becker and Eva Shina that looks at insu uh, life insurance companies. In, and in the US, life insurance companies, their bond holdings have to uh, be supported by capital. They, they have capital requirements. And how much capital they have to um, have for their bond holders depends on this risk category by the National uh, Association of, of Insurance uh, Commissioners, Nike risk categories. And, uh, and so what, what, what life insurance companies seem to do is within a, a Nike risk category, they tend to hold the bonds which have higher yields. Uh, th this is the percentage holding within this Nike risk category one of insurance companies in the highest quartile of yield uh, bonds, they, they hold almost 90% of those, whereas in the lowest, in the same naive risk group, they only hold a little bit more than 70. So there's, there's uh, this issue too. Okay, I, I, think, I think I need to speed up here. And there seems to be a price evidence that these bonds are actually not, uh, not uh, they, 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 they actually overvalued in, the, in terms of re uh, having reduced risk adjusted returns. Um, last uh, point, um, monetary policy and asset allocation. There seems to be evidence that monetary policy is systematically related to investors' asset allocation. Uh, in particular, monetary easing leads institutional investors to shift out of U.S. funds into foreign asset classes. And, and this is sort of relating my, uh, first to my first slide, the 
um, in, in FOMC announcement weeks, uh, investors move out of foreign funds into U.S. equity funds, which is consistent since we saw that these uh, returns in, in these weeks are high. This is also a paper which shows that even in Europe, uh, asset allocation by, by fund investors responds to monetary policy in, in the same way. Uh, lower real interest rates move into riskier asset classes. And the final slide I have is one um, which, which seems to argue that monetary policy affects the risk attitude of the market at large. There's this paper by Beckert, Herova, and Loluca who, who composed the VIX index, which is, as we know, a fear index, is the implied volatility um, of, of, of uh, backed out from, from, from stock index options. And you can decompose this into a, a, vol a pure uh, variance, uh, into, into a volatility component and a variance premium component. And they find that the risk aversion indicator, which is essentially the, 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 the variance risk premium, which they, which they isolate, seems to be related by, uh, to the monetary policy stance in the US. So let me wrap up. Um, what, what I find in the literature is that there are these channels which, which have, have been investigated through the uh, financial institutions, monetary in uh, policy affecting, affecting things through, through financial institutions, capital constraint uh, channel and credit center channel. There is this, the delegated portfolio management channel um, that monetary po uh, policy seems to be related to reaching for the yield asset allocation shift and the final slide I showed you, market risk preferences. Of course, the big question is the elephant in the room. How much of this is really causation? What is exogenous? What is endogenous? I mean, all these papers try to you know, have identification strategies which are supposed to identify the pure effects of, of monetary policy, but how effective uh, were they? Uh, you never know. Um, and how big are they economically, these, these, uh, the, these effects? That, that's always uh, the question. Uh, to me, I, I, I can believe very much that monetary policy has an effect on the behavior of agents in, in, in the markets, uh, as, as we've seen uh, uh, asset allocation uh, strategies and, and so on, but how much effect they have on asset prices very few papers that I've discussed uh, now can really uh, put their fingers on, on the magnitude of, of, of mispricing or, or effect on, on prices uh, so, so far. So obviously, great area for more research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.